great pleasure to do this uh, lecture and uh, about uh, LGBTQ composers. And uh, I'm going to, first I'm going to share screen here. That's a necessary step. And I'm going to start here with an attempt at humor. So how can we tell if somebody's gay? Well, here's a painting of Handel. This is my attempt at humor here. He's, uh, let's see, he is wearing a, f a powdered wig, but this is a very conservative, uh, conservative coat he's wearing here. So I'm not very convinced by that. But now look at this guy. Mm -hmm. With this, with this here, he could, you know, lead the parade, I would say. And here's another guy from the same era. Wow, he's got the shoes. We're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. You know, so uh, and this this is clothes are so fabulous. But anyway, so obviously I'm joking. These two guys, last two guys I've shown you is this is King George the Second and King George the First of Great Britain, and uh, neither of whom was gay. And uh, so you know, it's a, it's not only about don't judge a book by its cover. But um, this the reason I start this way is to sort of draw attention to the fact that. Um, this has been a very extremely interesting and also kind of difficult to, uh, lecture to prepare for because bef in the, you know, before maybe the 1920s, people were very, very much in the closet because of this way the societies were at that time, unfortunately. And so they've tended not to, a lot of them didn't leave any documents indicating their uh, preference, uh, you know, and so we're left with... Um, you know, other people's documents and uh, the people just were not very forthcoming. And so there's a kind of a, um, there, of course, also probably you're aware that there have been, um, you know, in the past musicologists have completely denied um, and any, any idea that uh, their favorite composer was uh, homosexual or lesbian. And uh, so the, there's that issue that the scholarship was, um, in denial for a while. And then there's also, as a, as Gary Carpenter, the, the queer musicologist points out that then there's, there's also a little bit of a tendency. You can see lots of kinds of websites out there who will assert that some historic composers was gay, but not really leave, uh, give any evidence of it. And so for him, that's not quite good enough. And uh, that's this, you know, it's not good enough for us either. I'm, I've, I've tried to uh, you know, find evidence that confirm, you know, confirms or denies whatever I'm trying to say. And, um, but it's a fact that because of all these things that I've just described, you know, any, anything and everything I say tonight can be challenged and you're welcome to challenge it. And I'll do my best to defend myself if I can. And so, but it's, I've put more work into this lecture than literally any other lecture I've done in the last year for, in the, in COVID time. And so I uh, hope you enjoy it. And so we're going to start uh, with, we're going to go in chronological order here. And we're starting with Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. And this is, uh, she's from the Baroque era and she lived from 1648 to 1695. You can tell already, uh, you know, about how um, difficult some things are to research. This is a painting that we think is probably of her. Right. This is the but you know sometimes you go back far enough in history and this is uh, these are the problems that you're going to uh, encounter. I, I can say that uh, it's not absolutely conclusive that she was lesbian, um, but I'll just describe a little bit about her and uh, how how why it is that uh, scholars think so. So she was an extremely prolific writer and besides Spanish and she lived in Mexico and was born there was, was uh, part indigenous and she uh, was a prolific composer and a very prolific writer and uh, was fluent besides Spanish was fluent in Latin and the Nahuatl language and she um, entered a convent at, as a teenager and had a uh, basically established a salon in in the convent in which uh, you know the the uh, a huge amount of intellectual activity went on you know a lot of reading and writing and uh, socializing and discussing of current events you know basically a salon as you would understand it um, although we can't say uh, definitely that she was, les was lesbian. She sure did run into trouble with the Roman Catholic Church, and um, eventually uh, that she was censored and uh, censured and um, had to uh, renounce uh, 
renounce her writing and stop writing. Uh, eventually, she uh, not. It was only a year after that she she decided, uh, died of one of the uh, diseases that uh, people were susceptible to back in those days. Um, so there's uh, the uh, the last document that she wrote. She provided an overview of her life of learning, an argument for secular learning as an aid to understanding of scripture, and a strong case for the education of women. And um, she signed it, I, the worst of all women. So it was a, quite a sad story from an intellectual point of view from, for her. And the reason that people think she might be lesbian is because she had a very close friendship with the vice wren, that is the wife of the ruler of Mexico. And she wrote some poetry, which I'm gonna to read to you now. Uh, that you're a woman far away is no hindrance to my love for the soul, as you well know, distance and sex don't count. And then she continues, let my love be ever doomed if guilty in its intent for loving you is a crime of which I will never repent. So there's, there's uh, quite a lot of writings to the vice wren uh, like this. And so that's the picture I can paint for you um, about Sor Juana. And actually a, a colleague friend of mine when I went to Peabody wrote a whole opera about her, which is quite a wonderful piece. Uh, we're gonna play a couple of Viancicos for her, uh, by her. And um, a Viancico was a, could be all kinds of things over the centuries. And uh, today simply thought of as a Christmas carol, but uh, back in Sor Juana's day, there were more serious um, Viancicos uh, that were religious and that, that tended to be more fashionable in Spain. And then there were, it was originally a dance form. And so this dance, uh, light dance uh, kind of feeling continued in the in Latin America. So um, here we have a Viancico to the Virgin Mary. Uh, there were religious ones and not religious ones. And um, so right here, you see that uh, she describes the Virgin Mary as the lady of the Reformation and the Reformation had, had was just uh, already rolling by that time. So it's not terribly surprising that she got in trouble with the Catholic Church. And so we're just gonna play for your enjoyment here one of her uh, Viancicos. <laughs> Viancicos generally had a verse and a chorus, so you see the two contrasting styles here. I'm going to play another one for you that is, is uh, much more dance-like. It's, it's quite, quite like this one. Quite wonderful music, but I've uh, got a lot of things to look at tonight, so we're gonna we're gonna move on. Um, so, the uh, one of the most famous uh, composers who we now believe to be gay uh, was George Frederick Handel, who lived from 1685 to 1759. Uh, there's a very interesting book called Queering the Pitch, uh, which is the earliest and probably still most important. Uh, book of uh, scholarship about, about gay composers. And there's a very interesting article about Gary C. Thomas, 
by Gary C. Thomas, who uh, talked about him. Uh, so Handel uh, never married, and uh, the king at one point asked him, uh, you are attracted to women, aren't you? And he said, I have no time for anything but music. And so there's, um, there's there aren't really documents that indicate uh, positively that uh, Handel was gay, but there's tons of, home, of uh, circumstantial evidence, shall we say. First of all, he moved to Italy as a teen, as a late, in his late teens, and um, was quickly uh, hanging out with uh, uh, lots of people who were known to be gay, including the composer Arcangelo Corelli and uh, Cardinal Ottoboni uh, in Rome. And then also actually the Duke of Milan had a big gay, gay community around him. Uh, when he moved to London, he moved straight into Burlington House, which is Lord Burlington uh, was known to have a big gay scene going on there, including um, the poet Alexander Pope. And uh, so he lived there a while and then he moved into Canons, which was more, you know, more or less until he got his own place. He was, um, he was staying in uh, places known to have a big gay scene. And so the, uh, the English press and writers at the time basically had um, regarded, you know, Italy as, uh, you know, to some, with some extent, correctly as a sort as a hotbed of, uh, of homosexuality and um, also, also you know, Italian opera was big. Like, you know, they, they uh, when Handel first arrived, he was one of the biggest opera composer stars and in, in the Italian language. And um, so he also then morphed later, into, as you probably know, into a composer of, of English oratorios and was a big hero for that. There's a huge, huge amount of music he wrote. And, um, you know, Handel wrote, uh, you know, a huge amount of text. And um, as you know, uh, Handel's Messiah is, you know, the greatest, you know, one of the greatest musical monuments to Christianity in the, in the English language. And so there's a, um, there's curiosity about, uh, you know, did he express anything uh, at any time in his music that was um, even coded to be homosexual and, and um, found a couple things that could possibly be, um, although it's important to realize that, you know, in his, you know, most of the texts that he said were absolutely right on, um, you know, the current worldview of the time and place in which he lived. And, you know, and he was an extremely successful composer and, and you know, and had his sort of pulse on the, on the, uh, you know, on what people in the mainstream wanted to hear. Um, but there, there are these uh, two examples. So it's, um, I, I'm very pleased that, that, that we have clergy in attendance so they can perhaps comment later. It's controversial to say the least to say that there is homosexual content in the Bible, but if there is anything, there's the story of King David and Jonathan, whose love was supposed to be greater than that of uh, any woman. And um, I invite your comments at the end um, about the, you know, what you guys think about that. And um, in the uh, Oratorio Saul, uh, this is towards the end, uh, Jonathan died and uh, King David sings a lament. And so I'll just uh, get this going and we can look at the score together and see the words. So Sorry about this. Oh, great is my peace. 
so that's a quite a wonderful aria and very interesting text. And there's another, uh, there's a story of uh, in Theodora, they take a moment and Jesus uh, rescues um, a young man he finds uh, from death. And so that's, he saw the lovely youth. This is a similar kind of lament, maybe less explicit uh, than the last one, but uh, just thought I'd run this by you. Sadly, we've got a lot of music to listen to, so we can't uh, can't spend too long on it. But the uh, you know I'm uh, very interesting, yeah, very interesting stuff. And so we're going to move on to talk about uh, Schubert, who was at Stroud the classical and the uh, Romantic eras, from 1797 to 1828. Um, beginning of gay musicology scholarship basically started with Maynard Solomon's article in 1989. Um, in which he pointed out um, a lot of letters between Schubert and his friends, uh, you know, were more, you know, very, shall we say, more, much more friendly and, and more or less of a gay character. This is um, him with his friends, uh, Johann Jenger and Anselm Huttenbrunner. And um, of course, as I said earlier, you can't, uh, you can't tell by looking at this painting that these guys are gay or not, but there's uh, a, really a lot of letters um, where they refer to, um, you know, Benvenuto Cellini's Peacocks, for example. Cellini was, an, was a known gay uh, sculptor. In fact, very sadly was imprisoned for being gay back in the 16th century. And um, in general, there's a lot of uh, sort of coded language and, um, professions of love and this sort of thing. There was a lot of protests and probably there still are saying that that, oh, that was just uh, sort of how men talk to each other in those days. And, um, you know, but uh, I think the, the jury is mostly convinced that uh, Schubert was gay. There's certainly no letters of this kind between Schubert and any woman, let's put it that way. Now, I'll just, I'll just remark, I should have remarked that uh, about uh, the, the paintings of King, the two King Georges I show you, showed you, you know, there is a, in different, different eras in history, different, definitely had different ideas about what is considered, uh, you know, appropriate or, uh, you know, dress or appropriate behavior. Like, for example, you know, we're talking about the King of Britain that, you know, or the two Kings of Britain that I showed you, you know, displaying, um, you know, silk stockings. And this was really a big thing. Like it was any man who had enough money to buy them would do that. It was just very normal to for men to go around with their legs displayed explicitly for the joy of women to look at look at them. And so that in that this is the 18th century. Also I'll remark for the first 150 years of ballet history, women were not allowed. That is to say, you know, there are no female dancers whatsoever. And then they were gay people involved in uh, in ballets when it started and all through its history. Um, but not all of them you know, like uh, certainly probably not the majority either. And so it's just a matter of, you know, King Louis XIV himself was, you know, more or less helped create uh, ballet and, but was not gay, but did actually dance ballet. And, you know, so there's, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of interesting questions about uh, what's considered, what's considered effeminate behavior today and what it was then. And anyway, this is a huge, huge topic to discuss. So, um, the uh, I'm gonna play a very familiar piece of Schubert for you. Just this is the near the beginning of the uh, unfinished Eighth Symphony, and uh, I'll just as you're listening to it, I'm going to tell you why I, I picked it. So in, in the same book, Queering the Pitch, the uh, famous feminist uh, musicologist Susan, Susan McClary reported that she was playing this uh, piece in her or assigned this piece for her mu music appreciation students to listen to and they came back and they said is this guy gay and so we'll just play this passage for you and you can see what you think
in any case, that, that is a question to which we'll return. And, uh, but I just want to move on a little bit here. Now, hold on. Just got to... Yeah. So um, here's the, the only existing photo of Frederick Chopin. It was only last year that a Swiss documentary, um, a radio documentary, pointed out that um, there was there's a lot of letters between Chopin and this man Titus Wojciechowski and other Polish men from when he, he knew when he was young. And um, so here's, now I don't read Polish, if anybody does, I'm impressed. And, um, but all these highlighted pronouns and articles are referring to a man. Here's the German translation. Here's these also refer to a man. Um, but in this, in this uh, re very recent translation to, into English, all the pronouns have been changed. Right, so this is an, an, a recent example of things that you know of musicologists trying to throw people off the path, but the, you'll see, uh, you know, if you just take a minute to read her, read here, remembering that the pronouns have been changed, um, that this is uh, you know of you know a love letter to uh, Wojciechowski, and um, Chopin was involved famously with um, Georges Sand, who was a uh, a woman who dressed like a man, smoked cigars, and generally behaved like men, and um, you know, to get her uh, to get attention to you know bring attention to her, well, to herself and also to her writing, they had a a relationship uh, of about ten years and spent time together. Uh, you know, traveled to Mallorca together several times, and. Um, but even the most conservative musicologist will acknowledge from looking at the letters that they wrote to each other that they would that it was not a sexual relationship so it's re it's a very recent thing in scholarship to refer to chopin as gay but seems to be a pretty reasonable argument and um, in keeping with the theme i'm going to play uh, one of the most important pianists of the 20th century who was although did have a wife and child was um, you know lived his life as a homosexual most more or less and so here's Vladimir Horowitz playing the uh, heroic polonaise of Chopin. Wonderful playing, and we've got a lot of stuff to go over, so we're just going to keep moving right along. Sorry that my stuff keeps resetting here, but we're moving on to the first composer in music history that we can say unequivocally, unequivocally was homosexual, who was Peter Tchaikovsky. And we can say that because his diaries are absolutely full 
of references to it and uh, his feelings about it, his experiences with gay prostitutes in the various cities he lived with. Um, for example, I'm going to read, he visited uh, Italy and I'm going to read a little bit some, uh, something, uh, actually this is from a censored letter, uh, like a letter that was censored by musicologists uh, to, to, from Tchaikovsky to his brother. At nine o'clock, I felt like going for a walk and went out. Some pimps, you know the kind, guess what I was looking for and wouldn't leave me alone. The bait they were using to hook the prey, that is me, was a delightful young creature. I had to put up some fierce resistance, resistance because the bait was working, but I didn't let it get the better of me. I don't know whether they wanted to blackmail me or just screw some money out of me, but I didn't let myself get, and take, get taken in. So there's, a, like I say, there's a lot of material in his diaries and letters. Um, recent scholarship characterizes it. I mean, it used to be, when I was a kid, we used to read um, you know, that he was really tormented by it. Um, there's re more recent scholarship thinks that probably he, maybe he wasn't so terribly much. Um, it's a fact that um, homosexuality was illegal when uh, Tchaikovsky was alive in Russia, but more research indicates that, you know, that it was, these laws were rarely enforced. And in fact, um, there was, a, when Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky was alive, there was a member of the royal family who was gay. So it was, uh, you know, a, not an extremely oppressive um, atmosphere. There's a huge number of stories about the circumstances of his death. It is known that he drank a glass of infected uh, water, knowing that there was a cholera epidemic going around in uh, Moscow at the time. And um, so the the manner of this is a you know not a clever thing to do and so there has been all manner of speculation as to whether he was perhaps coerced into doing that there's stories that you know of his old school society got together and told him that he had to kill himself because they were going to expose him there's a story that he was somehow involved with that member of the the, the, the czar's brother that i had uh, you know i had mentioned and uh, and then there's a lot of scholars that say that it's this is all nonsense you know that basically that uh, you know, that probably he didn't, he wasn't quite aware of, uh, you know, that the water he was drinking hadn't been boiled. And, uh, you know, it was a very tragic and, um, but, you know, not, uh, not intentional death. And so um, this is uh, subject to all manner of conspiracy theories in this regard. And so I'm going to play a familiar piece of his conducted by Leonard Bernstein, who we'll, we'll be talking about um, shortly. And uh, I apologize. I see that some ads are going to come up. This is something that I've tried my best to avoid, but it probably don't. I guess I won't avoid it this time. But think again, it's when you listen to this music, is this guy gay?
Fun stuff, fun stuff. Moving along, Camille Sassons was, uh, uh, had a, uh, is, you know, very well composer, had a wife and two children, and um, then uh, tragically one of his child children died of disease and the other, uh, his wife was very disturbed and was not able to properly care for the younger one, um, you know, with her grief. And so the second child died, uh, you know, another child died uh, two weeks later. Here's a, here's a photo of Sassons, who lived from 1835 to 1921. And uh, Camille can't, couldn't handle it very well and eventually uh, abandoned his wife. And um, whether he w was uh, gay before that is not something I know about, but he definitely did spend the rest of his life living as a homosexual, spent a lot of time in North Africa, um, ch chasing after teenage boys, and um, uh, you know, so there's a little doubt about him. And so we're going to play you something that's on the uh, on the OCO season this year, which I'm very pleased. The Carnival of the Animals is probably very familiar to you, but uh, it's I just love listening to it anyway. So we're going to play a little bit of it of, of the last movement, which is uh, so such a, a piece so full of joy. <laughs> Great fun. Now I'm, uh, we're going to look at a lesbian composer who lived from 1858 to 1944, Dame Ethel Smythe. And uh, here's a photo of her. Uh, she had uh, quite a lot of success during her lifetime, especially considering the obstacles placed to uh, against women uh, in doing anything in a man's world. And um, she wrote several operas. Um, her, we're going to play her the uh, the overture to our opera Wreckers, and uh, which was first performed in Leipzig in 1906, and, and uh, was one of two or three operas that was perf was performed in London, Paris, Berlin, and New York. And she, in fact, she was the very first um, woman to a composer to have an opera performed at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And unfortunately, it was over 100 years later before that the second one uh, came along. But in any case. Um, a very interesting composer who had, um, you know, uh, who fell in love with Virginia Woolf, among others, was definitely involved uh, in the suffragette movement uh, for uh, for trying to get uh, women to uh, the right to vote. And uh, most of the there there were there's no openly uh, gay themes in her operas, but definitely there is a. Uh, you know, there's a lot of very, very strong female characters. And uh, her music it was conducted by Thomas Beecham and uh, Bruno Walter. And uh, it's really very interesting. And I'm going to, we're gonna play a little bit of the overture to her opera, The Wreckers.
wish I had more time for all of this, but uh, a lot of composers to talk about. And um, so we're going to talk next about uh, Manuel de Falla, excuse me, about, um, well, about de Falla and his, possibly his lover, Maurice Ravel. So here's Ravel and there's de, there's de Falla. And, uh, excuse me, this is Ravel and Ricardo Vignes, his, his uh, partner for, for a while. Um, de Falla was also rumored, or we now believe that there was a relationship between them at some point. Um, the, uh, you know, the characterizations of Defia, of Ravel at the time were that someone who was very private and, um, you know, would go out dancing uh, or, go out, or dance, go out to places where both gay and street people, straight people would dance, but also, uh, but never get involved, never, um, never dance himself, just sit back and observe. Um, so the evidence that he was homosexual comes entirely from documents and uh, from le letters back and forth. Um, there was a, one of the places he went was this uh, important bar called Le Boeuf sur le Toit, the bull on the roof. A lot of people think that the, that the ballet by um, Mio was uh, named after the bar. In fact, it's the other way around. Jean Cocteau wrote, did the choreography for this Mio ballet, and then the bar got named out of it. And it was a, a pretty big gay scene. Um, apart from Jean Cocteau, there was also Poulenc and uh, Diaghilev, the famous choreographer. And um, the group of composers Les Cis also hung out there, although not all of them were gay. As you probably are aware, in the 1920s in Paris, there was a, a, a big artistic flourishing and uh, of all kinds of, and many Americans went there to study, um, and gay composers that were in the Salon of Gertrude Stein, who was a, one of the century's more famous lesbians, included Virgil Thompson and Aaron Copland, and, um, but it was not, definitely not exclusively a gay scene. Picasso and Stravinsky were hanging out there, and um, it was, uh, you know, one of the great artistic flourishing times in uh, Western history. And um, we're doing this to play a little bit. So uh, Ravel did travel to um, Spain at some point and uh, possibly to uh, visit Manuel de Falla. And so we're going to just enjoy that um, with a little bit of his piece that imitates Spanish style, Rhapsody Española. <laughs> cover here um, and I'm going to play a bit more by uh, a longer excerpt by Francis Poulenc who, uh, who uh, died in 1960. We're getting well into the 20th century and definitely to the point where there's no doubt anymore uh, whether these people were gay or not and um, Poulenc was described as half monk and half bad boy. He was a person full of contradictions um, who had uh, for who was a devout Catholic and flamboyantly open homosexual and also the father of a son. And so um, just had a good time and did what he felt like doing. And um, here we have an interesting um, excerpt from his opera, The Breasts of Theresius. So here you see Theresius standing there. And um, she, this is the very beginning of the opera. She's just told her husband that she's, you know, there's, she gives him a basically a, uh, you know, a feminist um, sort of a bill of rights. She declares herself a feminist. She doesn't want to have babies. She wants to go to soldier, become a soldier and go to war. And then um, she uh, says she's, she, her name's Teresa, Therese. She says she wants to take the name Theresias. And also she's very uh, tired of her breasts. And you'll, so you'll see what happens to them. Oh, <laughs> 
the beard. Sorry, I was not able to find a recording with subtitles, but uh, that's the, the content is, you get the idea. And uh, yeah, what, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing. So um, we're gonna go and uh, focus a little bit more on Americans now. And um, Aaron Copeland uh, is kind of the Dean of, of American composers. Um, and, uh, you know, wrote a lot of, um, you know very well one of his compositions is now it was became a, a beef commercial and stuff like this um he made little secret of being gay or at least from lived from 1900 to 1990 and uh by the you know towards the end of his life certainly was it, this was not a no secret and uh you know he was accepted uh, generally very well by society and uh, won the presidential medal of had the presidential medal of honor presented by ronald reagan no less and um apart from being gay he was also jewish and a communist and so of uh, this you know he was investigated by the uh, mccarthy uh, commission and um but of you know not but not punished in any way fortunately and his ballet appalachian spring is kind of the you know the one of the greatest pieces of american classical music and um it was originally made as a ballet without any specific title and the great um, ballet master uh, martha graham came up with the plot of appalachian spring so th th we're just going to listen to one of the uh, more wonderful parts of this ballet and the composer is conducting. Wonderful kinetic music, clearly under the influence of Stravinsky with all the mixed meter and the, particularly how he takes melodic fragments and uh, manipulates them. In this last passage you heard, that's uh, stylistically um, something that Stravinsky did a lot. Um, the, uh, we're also going to look a little bit at uh, Barber, 
Samuel Barber, who uh, was in a long-term relationship with uh, Giancarlo Malati, who was a prolific uh, Italian-American uh, opera composer. And um, Barber studied at the Curtis Institute and was uh, very successful there. And it went on to be a very prominent composer uh, early in life. And um, again, there's, you know, had, didn't need to make a big secret of his homosexuality by the time, by the end of his life. And uh, so we're going to play a little bit of uh, one of my favorites uh, from Barber, which is his violin concerto, which is, uh, yeah, Barber has a unique harmonic language. And um, this piece was written in the 1930s. And um, it's uh, for the 1930s, it's on the conservative side of classical music where it was at that time, but um, it's, the harmonies are lush and the expression is quite wonderful. Wish we had more time to uh, to uh, play it. We're going to move on though to bend back to back over to Britain to, to talk about Baron Benjamin Britton, who lived from 1913 to 1976 and founded the Alderborough Festival, which is still a major summer festival in uh, in England, and um, was the partner of uh, Peter Piers. And here we have a portrait of them from the National Portrait Gallery. So this indicates the level of acceptance that they enjoyed. Uh, when Britain died, uh, the Queen sent a letter of condolence to Mr. Piers. And um, there's, uh, shall we say, there's a, in the same way that there's gay themes lurking in uh, Tennessee Williams plays, there's several operas of uh, Britain's in which there are potentially gay themes sort of underneath the surface. But in his last opera, um, Death in Venice, it's not at all under the surface there's a uh, it's based directly on the uh, book of the same title by thomas mann and the uh, the character aschenbach who you see seated there has had an infatuation for the entire opera with this boy uh, tadzio who's who's a, Pol a polish tourist and they're in venice and um aschenbach spends most of the opera just watching and lusting and observing um and uh Although he he mocked the idea of uh, you know getting tarted up or anything like that, he's sort of psychologically slowly falling apart, and so you'll see he's wearing heavy makeup by the time at the end of the opera rolls around. On a musical level, uh, this is quite fascinating because um, Britain was influenced by Balinese ga gamelan music, and um, with all this, so it's all this fancy pitched percussion that you'll hear in this excerpt, and it creates quite a magical effect. And um, but he uses it when he re wants to refer to otherness, um, which is what he's you know more or less implying here. And there's a, in that book querying the pitch. There's quite a big article just on that topic. So here's uh, the concluding scene from Death in Venice by Benjamin Britten.
all the time we have time for but it's fair to say that this is one of the very first openly gay operas uh, it was written right at the end of his life in 1973. I'm going to talk about Leonard Bernstein a little bit who was uh, certainly uh, one of the you know the biggest uh, American conductor of all time and one of the most beloved composers of course remember he wrote West Side Story and a lot of other favorite things. This is a piece of his that probably has a gay subtext it's uh, called Serenade but it also uh, is has a subtitle of Symposium, um, which is a, a piece uh, by Plato, as you may remember, talking about the different kinds of love. And um, so uh, the, the kind of uh, gay love that you just saw in the opera that we were looking at, um, you know, by now is in our period in which we live is, you know, between students and teachers is the absolutely most frowned upon love that there is. But uh, back in ancient Greece, this was not regarded in that way at all. And um, it's a bit, it's a 35 minute piece that is, um, has all kinds of things in it. And we're just going to play the end of it uh, for you. I'll just, uh, so I'll just remark, there's all kinds of gay poses, composers I have, haven't talked about. Going right back to the 18th century, there's uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully, who, are, who worked at the uh, court of um, King Louis XIV. And um, in the 20th century, they're just to name a few, there's uh, David Diamond and um, Ned Roram, Henry Cowell, John Cage, Pierre Boulez, Michael Tippett. David L. Tredici, John Corleano, George Benjamin, and uh, you know, it's, since it's uh, also early 20th century, Peter Warlock, um, who uh, probably was involved with Frederick Delius, and so uh, many more than we have time for. And so, um, just I'm going to play one more thing here, and just uh, it, probably many of you are familiar with this, but you just listen to it, and then we'll talk about it a little bit.
So um, this is the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn, which is music to a ballet uh, by Claude Debussy. And he, um, you know, one thing uh, on a, uh, just talking about music, we can say that it's a, music, a piece that suspends time and has a lot of uh, ambiguous chords and lush uh, instrumentation. And uh, I will tell you that when I was younger, I figured that this was uh, this piece was really gay and the composer must be gay. And in fact, you look at Debussy's oeuvre, you can hardly find any butch music at all. And um, but in actual fact, Debussy was not gay. Uh, there's no evidence of it at all. He had a two altruistic relationships with various women. And uh, and so uh, this is, uh, you know, I don't I'm not meaning to be controversial in any way, but I'm just basically it's 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 a very interesting topic because the susan mcclary when she about the schubert that i talked about um earlier that i played for you um students came to her asking was the composer gay and she and as far as she knows she says yes he was but i mean you know um i i won't take your time but i mean i can find you know feminine examples of music of, examples of feminine music written by Beethoven, et cetera, you know. And so basically, I mean, I, I invite your discussion, you know, um, but I'm, I'm just basically saying that I think it's, it, the Debussy piece that we just heard, it's more accurate to call it feminine uh, rather than gay. And isn't it wonderful that we all have imaginations and no matter what our sexual orientation, we can, composers can write and improvise, uh, you know, things that we all have a feminine spirit in, inside us and a masculine spirit. And that's, that seems to be um, irrespective of what you know our imaginations, you know, and what and what we can feel and what we can, uh, how we can behave, uh, you know, under different circumstances. And 